preaching on the subject, what happens at death. Now, we hear much about death and dying today, and everybody's trying to make death easy and dignify death, and kids are being taught how to commit suicide without too much difficulty. Uh, the only thing is, if you commit suicide, the difficulty may follow it. That's what you need to realize. So tonight, Lord willing, I'm going to be preaching on what happens at death, and we're going to talk about the death, what happens to the death of an infant, what happens to the death of an, what happens at the death of an unsaved person, and then what happens to the death of a Christian. And so we'll we'll do that tonight, Lord willing, at, at six o'clock. So I hope you'll plan to be here for. I think it'll be a very helpful message and answer questions. Most folks ask, what happens when babies die, and uh, where do they go? And we'll talk about that. Look at your Bible and see the answer to that. If you'll stand with me, please. I'd like for us to read the Word of God together. Follow along, and uh, then we'll have a word of prayer, and uh, then we'll get into our message. In chapter uh, 26 and verse 47, Matthew 26, 47. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude, with swords and with staves, and with the chief priest and the elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave, him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that is he, hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, ma Hail Master, and he kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? And then they came, and they laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. And then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into its place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the scripture be fulfilled that saith it must be, in the same hour, said Jesus to the multitude, Are you come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I was daily with you teaching in the temple, and you laid no hold on me. Verse 56. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Now I want you to notice verse 56. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Now, our Father, this morning, what a needy people we are. Man at his best state is altogether vanity. The Apostle Paul said, I know in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. Isaiah said, from the crown of the head to the sole of the foot, there is no soundness but putrefying sores. And so, Lord, uh, we just need to face up with it that we're wicked, that we're sinful, and uh, that we have no help outside of you. There is no truth but God's truth. There is no light but your light. There is no hope but your hope. And so I pray tonight, that, uh, this morning, that you'll quieten our hearts, that we'll be attentive, that we'll listen from the small children to the oldest saint. Have your way in this service this morning. You have exalted your word above your name. So help us to, to know your word and to know that our faith is based on the assurance of the Word of God, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you. Be seated. This morning I want to speak to you on the subject of the prophecies of Christ's first coming. The prophecies of the Christ's first coming. We say as, as Christians that Jesus Christ is God. Last Sunday morning I preached on that subject. We affirm that He died on the cross to save us. That is the belief of every born-again Christian. We believe in the resurrection of Christ. For if Christ be not risen, your faith is in vain and you're yet in your sins. We believe in the second advent. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I will come again. Now, our faith must have a sure foundation. Because faith of itself is of no value. The world today and in the religious realm, are, they're teaching that faith alone is sufficient, that faith is the Savior. But faith without a foundation is just a dream. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a soap bubbles. 
So our faith must have a, uh, a, a, a sure footing. Now, I personally, I've been studying the Bible for 37 years. I've been preaching it for 25 years. And I'm confident that the Bible can stand against any and all critics. I am not intimidated with anybody's degrees, no matter who they are. And uh, when fellows start criticizing the Bible, I just remember that my Bible criticizes them. And I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not making fun of somebody that spent six years uh, trying to earn a degree. That's all right. But, you know, uh, sometimes we can be educated beyond our intelligence. And God's foolishness is wiser than men. Did you know the Bible says the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men? And uh, so then, uh, we need to know for sure and be confident that our faith is uh, in a book that is infallible. Now, that's the important thing for a Christian to know. Now, there are all kinds of proofs that the Bible is the Word of God. One time I was trying to prove the Bible is true to a fellow, and he, wanted me, he kept saying, well, put the Bible down. He didn't want me to use the Bible to prove my point. I said, it would be pretty hard to prove a chicken's a chicken without a chicken, wouldn't it? It would be pretty hard to prove an egg is an egg without an egg. But you want me to prove the Bible is the Word of God without my Bible. And that's what people want to do. They want to disarm you and don't let them do it. There are all kinds of proof. It's easy to prove. We could talk about the unity of the Bible. Did you know the Bible was written by 66 different authors? It was written over a period of uh, 1,400 years, and it was written from shepherds to statesmen, uh, carpenters, uh, and yet there's not one contradiction in all the Bible. Uh, there's the unity of the Bible. There's the archaeology. Did you know that the pick and spade proves that the Bible's the Word of God? Uh, there are no archaeological discoveries that discount the Word of God. In fact, they all prove the Bible. That's the point. And then there's congruity. Somebody said if the key fits, you got the right key. And the Bible is the key that fits the needs of men and women. People testify by the score. And then history proves the Bible. Someone has said history is his story. And, uh, you know, what year is this? Is this 1991? We say it is, isn't it? 1991 from what? Huh? Why, sure. Even your calendar is based on the fact that Jesus Christ lived. And, uh, and so, uh, then there's the, uh, it's survival. This book is, the book of Job is the oldest book known to man. And yet, in almost every secular university, the book of Job is studied as literature. If you go to the University of Washington, perhaps, if you study a course in literature, the Bible will be a textbook because it has absolutely no peers when it comes to literature. And then, of course, not only is it outstanding in proof in the area of, of the literature as a book, matter of fact, it surpasses, uh, surpasses Shakespeare and all the others, but uh, there is its, uh, its influence in the world. This book has changed entire continents. It changes them. And uh, that's why this book has been banned from countries such as Russia and Cuba and other countries. Why? Because it has such a profound influence on a society. Why would anyone try to ban a book that doesn't have any influence or any power? So it changes entire the direction of nations. So the, the proofs are, you know, are uh, abundant. But today we're only going to look at one line of proof, and that is the area of prophecy. And in prophecy, we're going to look at just one uh, segment of Bible prophecy. And I want us to think about the prophecies that talk about the first coming, the birth of Jesus Christ himself. We'll look at those. Now, if you needed more, there's enough to last you till you, the day you die. You will not exhaust this book. It's as infallible as God. And so the first thing I want us to notice is that Christ's coming was prophesied to be the seed of of the woman. Now that's interesting because the Bible is a man's book. It's a male book. That's why these uh, folks, uh, uh, certain groups are trying to get rid of the Bible because the book is predominantly male. And there are those that are trying to talk about mother God. You know, somebody says, I know God's a male. I just talked to her this morning. Well, you may have talked to her, but you didn't talk to the God of the Bible because the God of the Bible is masculine. He's called father, not mother, but he is mother too. And then the Holy Spirit is called male, and Jesus is male, and all the angels are male. The Bible is a male book, but it loves the female, and it exalts her. Wherever this Bible is practiced, the female is exalted, and she's honored, by the way. You women ought to shape up and realize that this book is the best friend you've got. 
For the Bible says to the husband, Husband, love your wife even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So if a woman wanted to be exalted, she ought to get her husband in love with Jesus Christ. And a man who abuses his wife and is unkind to her and is not courteous to his wife, if he professes to be a Christian, he's not a good Christian and he doesn't understand the Word of God. The Bible exalts her. But I'm telling you, the book is a male book. Now, but the interesting thing is the very first prophecy in the Bible that has to do with the coming of Jesus has to do with the female, not the male. For instance, in Genesis chapter 3, and look at verse 15. Genesis 3, 15, the oldest prophecy in your Bible, and it has to do with the coming of Jesus Christ. Genesis 3, 15, God said to Eve, I will put enmity, or to the devil, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. The only thing is, a woman doesn't have seed. And yet the prophecy is that the woman would have seed, and that the devil would be opposed to this woman and her seed. And obviously this refers to the Lord Jesus Christ, a specific individual, that the devil throughout all the Bible tried to stop. And that is why in all the Old Testament, uh, God tried to keep a line pure for the Messiah, and the devil tried all, every time to destroy it. That's why in the Old Testament, Hebrew women wanted to have children because they hoped that their seed would be the Messiah. And so they longed to bring forth this promise right here. And the Old Testament women, as they read their Bible, they wanted to be godly women. And they hoped that their child would be the Messiah. For the first promise in their Bible was, it would be the seed of the woman. Turn to Isaiah 7, 14, please. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And then if you go to Isaiah 9, over just to the right a few pages, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And there shall be no end to his government. And, he shall, and upon the throne of David and upon the kingdom to, to order it and establish it with justice and with, uh, with judgment and justice from henceforth forever, the zeal of the Lord will perform this. So here then we have the oldest prophecy in the Bible talking about the woman's seed. Uh, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And this seed, again, in Isaiah 7, 14, the Lord, a virgin will conceive. For unto us a child is born. Not only that, the woman was the one to whom the Lord appeared in the New Testament. It wasn't to the man. The Lord came to a woman. Her name was Mary. In Luke chapter 1, in, uh, chapter 1 verse 26, it says, And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph. The Bible is a male book. The Bible is predominantly male. God is, and the Holy Spirit and Jesus, all are male. Angels are male. And yet, the oldest prophecy in the Bible is to the woman. And in the New Testament, the first appearance is to the woman. And we have the oldest prophecy about the birth of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus... Uh, was born to the virgin, it says, to a virgin, a spouse. Isaiah, we just read in Isaiah that a virgin would have a son. And uh, so the Lord sends, uh, to, to, sends to Mary that the Messiah would be her seed. Secondly, Christ's coming would not only be of the virgin or of the, of the seed of the woman, but it would be of the seed of Abraham. Now, God's promise to bless the whole world through Jesus Christ. In Genesis 12, let's go back there, please. Genesis 12, that's an important dividing point in your Bible. Genesis chapter 12, and this is where Abraham comes on the scene. Abraham. It's after the Tower of Babel, after the flood. In Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, notice what God says to Abraham. Abraham, he says, I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now here is a promise made 
thousands of years before Jesus was ever born, that through Abraham, through his seed, all the people of the earth would be blessed. Now, did you ever stop to think about that? Here's a problem. What if somebody said to you, through you, all the people of the earth would be blessed? Wouldn't that be a ridiculous statement? But here is one man, a Hebrew, and God says to him, thousands of years before Jesus is born, through you, through your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Why, well, it's preposterous. And yet here's one man he's saying it to, a little fellow from over there by the Euphrates River. All right? Now then, if you go to Galatians chapter, chapter 3 and verse 16, Paul makes it very clear that this is not a plural uh, seed, but it's singular. Singular. In Galatians 3.16, Paul says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. And he said, and, to, uh, and he said not, and to seeds of many. I'm in Galatians 3.16. And to seeds of many, but as of one, and thy seed, which is Christ. So the Apostle Paul is very clear in Galatians 3.16 to interpret the promise. That it not only referred to the Jewish nation that would be a blessing to the rest of the world. And by the way, the Jewish nation has been a blessing to the rest of the world. In fact, your Bible is a Jewish book. Every book in it was written by a Jew. All of the apostles were Jews. Jesus was a Jew. So the light of the world that comes to the world through a book came through the Jewish nation. And in fact, the time is coming when the Jewish nation is going to be the life of the world. Of course, no politician wants to say that, and most Bible believers are, are afraid to say it. But when the church has gone out of here and the tribulation starts, God's going to start dealing with Israel as a nation, and the nation of Israel is going to be converted. They're in unbelief right now concerning Christ. So then the, the oldest prophecy has to do with the seed of the woman. The second one has to do with the seed of Abraham. Notice again, if you will, Jesus was to be of the tribe of Judah. Now there were 12 tribes. Who would guess that the Messiah would come of the tribe of Judah? Why not the tribe of Levi? Why not Reuben? He was the oldest tribe. Why not Benjamin? He was the young boy that got the double portion. Why Judah? And yet the prophecy is very clear that it would be of Judah. Go to 49, Genesis 49:10. You ought to see these folks. It'll help you if you ever have to prove and won't need to prove that the Bible's the Word of God. You'll have some ammunition. In Genesis 49, 10. Now, this was written while they were still uh, in Egypt. You've heard the song, Tell Old Pharaoh, Let My People Go. Well, Joseph and uh, Jacob and all of the, the, the 70 people, as a matter of fact, they became a great multitude in Egypt. But this text was written, and these words were said... While they were in Egypt, they'd never been to the promised land. And yet in Genesis 49, 10, the old man Jacob gives a prophecy. And here's what he says. The scepter. Well, you know what a scepter is? The scepter is the staff a king has. A king holds a scepter in his hand. It says, the, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from defeat, between his feet until Shiloh come. Well, Shiloh's the Messiah. Shiloh, until Messiah come. And unto him, that is the Messiah, shall the gathering of the people be. So here is a prophecy that Jesus Christ would come of the tribe of Judah. Not of Reuben, not of Gad, not of Nephtali, not of Manasseh, not of Ephraim, not of uh, the Levites, but of Judah. And Jesus was born to the tribe of Judah. In Matthew 2, 6, here's what it says. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, art not the least among the, among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel, out of Judah. Hebrews 7, 14. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which the tribes Moses said nothing concerning the priesthood. He's the seed of the woman, Genesis 3, 15. He's the seed of Abraham, Genesis 12, 3. He's the tribe of Judah, according to Genesis 49, 10. The very city where Jesus was to be born was prophesied in the Old Testament. You know what city it was? Bethlehem. Let's turn to the Old Testament, if you will. Turn to Micah 5, 2. Micah 5, 2. 
the minor, prophet, the minor prophets, if you find Jonah, Micah, Nahum, one of those over there, Old Testament, toward the, toward the end of it. But in Micah 5, 2, listen to what Micah said. And by the way, this was written 772 years before the birth of Christ. You know, 772 years is a long time. The United States of America has only been around a little more than 200 years, right? Or been a nation. And yet, 772 years before the event, a prophet, very insignificant prophet, said, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, well, there it is, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler over Israel. Jesus has never ruled over Israel. But he will. But he never has. He came as a king to rule. What'd they do? Crucify him. Now that's another line of prophecy that we could talk about. But my point is that G the Bible says that Jesus was to be the seed of the woman, a virgin, of Abraham, of the tribe of Judah, the very city, Bethlehem. Now listen, if you've got anything between your ears, you know it would be absolutely impossible. The very things that I've mentioned would be impossible for them to, to happen. The Bible is the book of God. It's absolute. My wife and I, we were watching uh, a, a presentation on the Bible last night. And I said to my wife, I says, you know, I says, the Bible is such a profound book that it would be impossible for man to have written it without God. And she said one of the most profound things I've ever heard anybody say, I guess. She says, why, it's so pro not only so profound that man couldn't write it, it's almost so profound that man can't understand it. I mean, you spend your lifetime trying to understand the Bible. And you'll die and still say there's still much land to be conquered. And so Bethlehem, Micah 5, 2, But thou Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth uh, unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. This is 772 years before the birth of Christ. Had to be a miracle. Let's suppose I made a prophecy at the watch night service, which is going to happen here December 31. And I said, folks, I have a, pr a prophecy for 1992. There's going to be a wreck in Linwood. Why are you laughing? You say, I got one out in the parking lot, and I don't mean that. But you know, if I told you there was going to be a wreck in Linwood, Washington, you would do just what you did. You would laugh and say, that's not a prophecy. I mean, that's certain, right? Well, let's suppose I said, I tell you what, there'll be one at 196 and 44th Avenue. <laughs> That's pretty certain too, right? In, in a year, but it narrows it down, right? Because now I've narrowed it down not only for my city, I've put it at an intersection. But let's suppose I narrow it down and I say, it's going to be a Volvo. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> yeah. Well, now that would really narrow it down, wouldn't it? But let's suppose I told you what day it would happen. That would narrow it down. You say, well, pastor, you've got a Volvo, so you'd make it happen. <laughs> well, that's an idea. But let's say that I have nothing to do with it. I'm not the driver. We'll pick another car. Let's say it's a Cadillac. None of our folks have Cadillacs. So we'll say it's a Cadillac. The Lutherans drive Cadillacs. Rich folks drive Cadillacs. Baptists drive Volkswagen and things like that. But let's narrow it down. Let's say it's a Cadillac, okay? You know right now it's an impossibility. When I said Linwood, you said, oh, that's possible. That's not a prophecy. When I said 196th and 44th, I've narrowed it down. But that's a busy, bad intersection, right? There'll probably be one there before the year's over, or next year. But when I said Cadillac, you said, oh, oh, just a minute. Now you've stepped into the, probably the, 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 the unlikely. But if I told you the day, and I told you the license number, and I told you that the driver was a woman with contact lenses, you'd say, forget it, forget it. It's impossible. It's impossible. Now, do you realize that what I've showed you in the Old Testament, and I've not, I, we haven't even scratched the veneer. But do you realize that what I've told you is absolutely impossible from the human point of view? It's impossible. To go back 772 years and say that the ruler of Israel would be born in Judah, in Bethlehem, is impossible. Couldn't be done. Yet it was, and history bears it out. 
And the fact that Jesus Christ existed, it, you could, it's easier to prove that Jesus existed than it is to prove that Abraham Lincoln existed. You say, well, we've got portraits. How do you know you do? You trust photography? Say, can't trust your eyes. Not only that, the city, but you can see the events that led up to this unlikely. Let's go to Luke chapter 2, and I want to show you how that the sovereign God works out events to make this happen. You couldn't fabricate this if your life depended on it. And what would be the purpose anyway? Why would anybody want to fabricate it? What would be the motivation? Why would Luke fabricate the story? You've got to have a motive for what you do. So let's look, take a look at look, Luke 2 and chapter 1 and look what happens here, how God works this out so that Micah 5, 2 will be fulfilled. Luke 2, 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus. Well, I wonder how Caesar Augustus got to be the fellow in charge just at that time. And I wonder why they started taxation just at that time. And I wonder why Rome, Rome was ruling over Israel at that time. Rome wasn't ruling when Micah wrote the text. So I wonder why it is that, that, this, that this, uh, this leader was in, in, in uh, control. I wonder why this leader was over Israel and Judah. And wonder why he sent out a decree that certain people would be taxed. And wonder why he set it up that they had to go to their city to be taxed. You know why? Because there's a God in heaven who rules in the affairs of men. He sets up the king and he takes them down. And folks, life is bigger than what you see. You need to be able to see the God of heaven and earth working in the affairs of the universe and in the affairs of government and the affairs of men. And you can't interpret life without the Bible. You can't, it's impossible to interpret life without the book. No wonder people are lost and wandering and running to and fro and trying to figure out what in the world's going on. It's impossible to know what's going on. Okay, Luke 2, 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made by Cyrenus, was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone to his own city. And Joseph went up from Galilee out of Nazareth into Judea. Well, well, well. Prophesied that he, Jesus would be born in Judea. But here, the, here the, the, the supposed father and the mother live up in Nazareth, in Galilee. So God's got to work it out so they get down to Judea. So he does. Notice this. And they go down to, to the city of David. To the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in, mange, in the manger because there was no room in the inn. And so God promised that it would be the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Judah, the city of Bethlehem. Not only that, he said he would be of the son of David the son of David. You see, a king must be of the lineage of the king. In Isaiah 11, 9, 11, 1, it says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the Spirit of wisdom, and the Spirit of understanding, and the Spirit of counsel, and the Spirit of might, and the Spirit of the knowledge of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding and the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But in, with righteousness doth he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins. And faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Listen. And the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed. Their little ones shall lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. And the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You know that's not happening today. You know that's never happened. 
We're talking about prophecies concerning the first coming of Jesus. And the Bible says he would be born in Bethlehem of Judea, the city of David. He would be the son of David, the son of Abraham, of a virgin, the seed of the woman. Now then, winding this up, let's go to Isaiah 7, 14. Isaiah 7, 14. Not only did, it prop, did your Bible prophesy that he would be the seed of the woman, seed of Abraham, tribe of Judah, city of Bethlehem, son of David, lineage of David, but that he would be born of a virgin. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Now let me tell you something. If a young maiden conceived, it would not be a sign. Would not be a sign. Young maidens conceive all the time. Virgins do not. If you conceive today, your virginity is over prior to your conception. Unless medical science goes in and tries to plant a, a seed in an ovary. But God did something like that centuries ago in a miraculous way. And the sign was that this woman was not, she had never been married and wasn't married. She was pure. Now, can you imagine anybody a thousand years or a thousand years before Christ writing something like this and saying, here's going to be a sign, a virgin will conceive? Do you realize you'd be laughed right out of prophet, prophetic school, wouldn't you? You'd be laughed right out of class. And yet, it was fulfilled exactly the way the Bible says it. For in Luke 1, 26, it says, And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, and the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came into her and said, Hail, thou art uh, highly favored uh, of the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at the saying, and cast in the mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and call his name Jesus. Now the details in the Bible are here. And uh, then, last of all, in the Old Testament, you need not turn there, but it was prophesied that Jesus Christ would come out of Egypt. Would come out of Egypt. Now, can you imagine the Old Testament prophesying that the Savior would come out of Egypt? How could anybody ever know that? And yet Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1 said, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and I called my son out of Egypt. Now, after Jesus was born, a decree went forth to kill all the boy babies, two years old and so on. And the angel of the Lord told Joseph and Mary to take their child and go to Egypt. And they stayed in Egypt until the enemies were dead. And then the Lord told him to take his son out of Egypt. Now Matthew 2.15 says, And there, and, uh, and, and was, that Jesus was there until the death of Herod, that is in Egypt, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt have I called my son. So the Bible foretold hundreds of years before these events, it tells every detail with accuracy. It foretold that he would be the seed of the woman. It foretold that he would be the seed of Abraham. It foretold that he would be of the tribe of Judah. It foretold the city of Bethlehem would be the place of his birth, that he would be the lineage of David and of, and, uh, of a virgin. Also that he would go into Egypt and that he would be called out. Now these are just a fraction of the proofs that you have in your Bible that it is infallible, and believable. It, now, if I can believe my Bible about those things, I can believe it when it talks about heaven, when it talks about hell, and when it talks about how to be saved. Now, if there's any truth on this planet, it's in this book. And you can count on its prophecies. Christ's first coming was confirmed, has confirmed the promises of God. And if God has kept his word about the first promises, prophecies, he will keep his word about the second prophecies. And you and I are living in a day when you're seeing world events shape up for the establishment of the Antichrist before the return of Jesus Christ. These things are happening. Now, in John 5, 22, it says, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Now then, 
<clears throat> what about our faith? Is it pie in the sky? Is it easy believism? I was in a house one time trying to win a man to Christ several years ago at Mount Lake Terrace. And I was sitting across the kitchen table from him and sitting there talking, had my Bible laying out on the table talking to him. He was sitting there drinking his Ole and puffing his Winston. And he's looked at the Bible and he said, well, Reverend, he says, I don't need a crutch. <laughs> and he was drinking one and smoking one. And he looked at the Bible and said, I don't need a crutch. I tell you what, I need one because I'm extremely crippled. In fact, it's worse than that. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. I don't know about you, I qualify as ungodly. Now you do too, you just may not know it. But we all qualify as ungodly. My wife said to me last night, she says, it's strange that it took seven days to create the world and seven years for God to destroy it in the, in the tribulation. I thought about that a, mo a little while and I thought this. You know, it doesn't take God seven days to destroy it or seven years to destroy it. Do you realize that the tribulation period will still be seven years of God's mercy extended to humanity so he can be saved? God has extended his mercy all down through the ages. And for 2,000 years, even in this age in which you're living, God is extending his mercy to you. You know how he's extending his mercy? By allowing Jesus Christ to die on the cross and pay for your sins. And you don't have to join a church to go to heaven. You don't have to get baptized to go to heaven. You don't have to give money to go to heaven. You don't have to take a trip to some holy land to, to go to heaven. All you have to do in this age is to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Let him, be the, let him be your Savior and Lord. For whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I wonder about you. Are you saved? I'm not asking you if you've been, ever been baptized or confirmed. I'm not asking you if you believe in God. I'm sure you do. But let me ask you this. Are you saved? That's the most important thing. It's appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. We're going to talk about that tonight, Lord willing, in the, in the 6 o'clock uh, in the evening service. But you may not be here for the evening service. You may never be back. Who knows? The dear lady I told you about that got saved here about three weeks ago, her brother, they found him up here at, uh, at Smoky Point behind a motel. Somebody had hit him in the back of the head with an instrument. His brain swelled up. He died yesterday. She said to me, Pastor, I don't know if my brother was saved or not. I don't know if he was saved or not. I hope he was. But there's nothing to be done about that. It's over. Are you saved? That's the most important thing, isn't it? Are you? God loves you. You want to know how much he loved you? All you got to do is look at the cross. He loves you. Jesus loves you. And he wants to save you. And these prophecies, many of these that we've looked at today, these prophecies are to assure you that you can believe your Bible. You can believe it. You can trust it. I was 17 years old when I put my faith in this book. I was a teenager, First Baptist Church in Wenatchee. And the preacher gave an invitation. I was a visitor that Sunday morning. The preacher gave the invitation. And I stepped out from the back row. And I came forward. And the old man said to me, Why are you coming forward this morning, son? I said, I'd like to be saved today. And a man took me in a prayer room. First Baptist Church in Wenatchee. Took me in a prayer room and sat down with the Bible. This book. And he opened it to some scripture and he showed me how Jesus died for me. And that if I would trust Jesus by faith, accept him as my Savior, that he would save me. I believed that. I did that. Hey, that's been 36 years ago. 36 years ago.